Let's go to a question here on the ACL. An elite football player has sustained a left knee injury during play. A dynamic imaging analysis performed on the affected knee, which shows anterior shift and internal rotation of the tibia at low flexion angles. There is also some mild medial tibial translation of the tibia at greater flexion angles. What structures have most likely been injured? And the answer is the ACL, as you probably have correctly guessed. So ACLs are a uh, fairly common injury. There's over 400,000 ACL reconstructions done every year. Uh, it's due to a non-contact uh, pivoting twisting injury. It's often associated with a meniscus tear. And in chronically ACL deficient knees, you can have chondral injuries uh, as well as complex unrepairable meniscal tears. There are some gender-related differences between uh, males and females who injure their ACLs. Interestingly, the females uh, get more ACL injuries on the supporting leg, while males will get uh, more ACL injuries on their kicking leg. There are gender differences uh, with regard to uh, the size of the notch. Females have smaller intercalator notches, a smaller ACL. Uh, they can be hypermobile with increased joint laxity. Biomechanically, uh, there is increased knee valgus and extension during landing. Um, in females, they also have a lower hamstring to quad ratio. They're more quad dominant. There are some hormonal uh, issues uh, in the preoperatory phases of menses. Uh, this can affect their coordination and lead to uh, injuries. And there are some, also some genetic factors. Uh, the COL5A1 gene is linked to a decreased risk of injury in women. The function of the ACL is to act as a secondary restraint uh, to tibial rotation and various valgus rotation, uh, as well as the obvious uh, ant uh, preventing anterior translation of tibial relative to the femur. Um, as we described earlier, there are two bundles, the anterior medial bundle as well as the posterior bundle. We talked about the blood supply of the middle geniculate artery. It's innervated by the posterior articular nerve, which is the branch of the tibial nerve, and the ACL strength of the max load to failure is 2200 newtons. Patients will present with a pop. Uh, they'll both get swelling due to a hemarthrosis. Uh, on exam, you'll have a positive Lachman's test, which is a very sensitive test. Uh, but note that if you have a PCL tear, this can give you a false Lachman due to posterior subluxation. Pivot shift is another uh, common uh, finding uh, when the knee is extended to flexion. Uh, the knee reduces at 20 to 30 degrees of flexion, and the patient has to be completely relaxed and unguarded to elicit this response. The KT-1000 is a way to quantify the anterior laxity as well. We talked about the Sagan fracture that you'll see on the, uh, on the uh, radiograph, which is just an avulsion of the ALL insertion. And this is associated with the ACL tear 75 to 100% of the time. Another quiz question for you. Which of the following bone bruise patterns are seen on the magnetic resonance imaging is most consistent with an anterior cruciate ligament tear? This is a very common question, and the answer is number three, the posterior lateral tibia and the lateral femoral condyle. So diagnostic uh, tests, including the MRI, can reveal uh, the torn ACL, which is a discontinuity of the fibers on the T2 images. Um, the orientation of the fibers will be very flat because the uh, tibia is subluxed anteriorly. In uh, chronic ACL deficiencies, um, this acute angle is very common where the ACL will scar down to the piece. Here's that bone bruising question. Uh, so you'll see the, uh, the posterior uh, lateral tibial plateau as a, a, a lot of signal, and that uh, is due, due to the, uh, the injury as it collides with the middle one-third of the lateral femoral uh, condyle. On the coronal view, you'll see discontinuity of the fibers, and you'll also see fluid against the lateral wall, uh, which is the empty notch sign. In a normal ACL, uh, this should have continuity of fibers all the way from the tibia to the femur. Treatment for uh, non-operative treatment. Uh, these are primarily for patients that have uh, very low demand and that don't have symptomatic, symptomatic laxity. But operative uh, uh, reconstruction is indicated for young active patients, uh, and particularly for children uh, where um, activity modification is not really realistic. You can have associated Injuries, in addition to the ACL tear, including an MCL injury, you can have meniscus tears, which can be repaired at the same time, as well as a posterior lateral corner injury. You definitely don't want to miss the posterior lateral corner injury because this can lead to failure of your ACL reconstruction. 
Return to play is largely influenced by psychological, uh, demographic, and functional uh, factors in terms of treatment. Uh, historically, uh, there was an attempt to repair the ligament instead of reconstructing it with a graft. And ligament repair traditionally had a very high failure rate. Revision ACL uh, is indicated if you have a failure of prior ACL reconstruction. So a common thing that's tested on uh, these exams is uh, issues with tunnel placement. So with regard to the femoral tunnel placement, proper placement uh, in the sagittal plane is really close to the posterior cortex. You want to make this one to two millimeters um, uh, within the back of the, of the femur. On the coronal plane, uh, the trend now is to make it more horizontal, roughly in the 9 to 10 o'clock position uh, to create that horizontal graft position. On the tibial tunnel side, proper placement on the sagittal plane, um, this should be 10 to 11 millimeters in front of the anterior border of the PCL or, um, or just uh, medial to the uh, anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And in the coronal plane, the tunnel trajectory should be less than 75 degrees from horizontal. For graft uh, uh, placement, uh, you can um, take some of the creep out of the graft by uh, preconditioning the graft. And this can reduce stress relaxation up to 50%. And the graft should be uh, uh, tensioned. However, uh, in studies looking at tensioning for, uh, 20, for 20 newtons versus 40 newtons, uh, there is really no, uh, no difference. And you want to fix and secure the graft uh, with the knee in a, roughly about 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. In revision ACLs, uh, you want to use the high-strength graft, uh, typically hamstring or allograft. Uh, obviously, reharvesting of a bone patellar tendon bone graft is contraindicated. A bone uh, patellar tendon bone autograft is, is one of uh, the possible grafts that you can use for reconstructing the ACL. Uh, this is obviously the patient's own tissue. Uh, and the advantage here is that there's no chance of acquiring someone else's infection. You get bone-to-bone -bone healing. Uh, you, you can get a higher incidence of anterior knee pain if you harvest the patellar tendon. The maximum load uh, to failure is 2,600 newtons uh, with this particular graft. Uh, there are some unique complications associated with bone patellar tendon bone, including patellar fracture and patellar tendon rupture. The hamstring autograft is a, a common option uh, that's utilized today. Uh, the pros and cons, uh, the pros are it's a smaller incision. Uh, they tend to be less painful. They have less anterior knee pain. That's a very strong graft with a maximum load to failure of approximately 4,000 newtons. Uh, but there can be some concern about hamstring weakness, uh, particularly in female athletes, uh, which can lead to potential, uh, potential re-rupture. You can get tunnel widening with a windshield wiper effect, and as we mentioned, uh, residual hamstring weakness. Uh, there's also uh, allograft options, uh, but you worry about disease. Uh, transmission risk, HIV is pretty rare. It's one in a million. Uh, you worry a little bit more about hepatitis. Uh, there is increased risk of re-rupture in young athletes, uh, roughly a four-time higher risk of graft re-rupture uh, in very young patients. For graft processing, there's a, a variety of different processing uh, uh, ways to, uh, to sterilize the graft, supercritical CO2, uh, radiation of greater than 3 megarads, uh, which can decrease the structural mechanical properties, a deep freezing, uh, which destroys cells but doesn't affect the strength of the graft, and 4% CHG. Uh, quad tendon autograft, not very common, uh, but this is taken with a uh, patellar bone plug. Rehabilitation after an ACL reconstruction, um, really it's uh, immediate weight bearing, and it's been shown to reduce patellar femoral uh, pain. You really want to emphasize uh, early full passive extension uh, so they don't get a flexion contracture. And for any of these rehab exercises, uh, you, you want to perform exercises that don't place excess stress on the graft. Um, Appropriate rehab regimens include eccentric strengthening at three weeks, uh, which has been uh, shown to increase quad uh, uh, hypertrophy and strength. And you want to have the patients do active knee motion between 35 uh, and 90 degrees of flexion. Uh, you want to emphasize closed chain as opposed to open chain activities. Um, again, avoiding open chain uh, activities and avoiding isokinetic quad strengthening during the early rehab. It's important, particularly for female athletes, to uh, provide some neuromuscular training uh, once they recover. Uh, we call it jump training. And uh, you also want to increase the hamstring strength to de decrease the uh, quad dominance ratio. Complications can be to, uh, due to uh, tunnel malposition. It's really the most common cause of ACL failure. 
So for a femoral tunnel a malposition in the coronal plane, uh, if you have a very vertical tunnel, although this will minimize the um, anterior-posterior translation, uh, you'll still have a rotational instability, uh, which can be identified with the positive pivot shift. In the sagittal plane, if the tunnel is anterior, this can lead, lead to a knee that is tight in flexion and loose in extension. If the femoral tunnel is placed uh, too posteriorly, this leads to a knee that is lax in flexion and tight in extension. Well, what about the tibial tunnel malposition in the sagittal plane? Uh, anterior misplacement leads to a knee that is tight in extension or uh, tight in flexion um, uh, with impingement and extension as the uh, graft hits the intercondylar notch. <clears throat> if the tibial tunnel is too posteriorly misplaced, uh, this will lead to an ACL that will impinge with the PCL. Other causes of failure include inadequate graft fixation. Uh, this is if your graft screw divergence is greater than 30 degrees, uh, where the interference screw um, doesn't get a good enough bite on the, on the graft. Um, and more common cause of failure is really a misdiagnosis. Uh, if you have other injuries, like a push lateral corner injury, this will lead to failure of your ACL reconstruction. Infection, obviously, is a, you know, a bad thing that can happen, uh, most commonly with staph epi. Uh, treatment is to perform, uh, uh, or to diagnose this, you perform an immediate joint aspiration with gram standing culture. Treatment is an arthroscopic irrigation debridement. Uh, unfortunately, if this is staph aureus, you have the less likely um, uh, success rate of retaining the graft. You can also get uh, loss of motion and stiffness. Um, for preoperative uh, management, uh, it's always a good thing to try to get full range of motion prior to reconstructing your ACL. Uh, to prevent this uh, intraoperatively, you want to make sure your, your tunnels are pay, placed properly. If these, if these patients do have uh, range of motion issues uh, postoperatively in the first 12 weeks, you want to aggressively treat them with physical therapy and serial splinting. If it's beyond 12 weeks, um, then you consider lysis of adhesions and, um, and or a manipulation. Another complication is the infrapatellar contracture sy syndrome. And on physical exam, this will show decreased patellar translation. Other complications uh, include patellar tendon rupture. You'll see patella alta on the lateral radiograph. RSD is a bad problem, a patellar fracture. Uh, most of these occur at about three months post-op, a failure of the hardware and tunnel osteolysis. Other complications include late arthritis. This could be related to uh, meniscal tears, uh, local nerve irritation with saphenous nerve, <clears throat> and a cyclops lesion, which is uh, a proliferation of scar tissue within the intercolor notch, and they get uh, annoying mechanical symptoms at terminal extension. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.